hear anybody. Yes, um, yeah, we're good. Okay. All right. Oh, and now we're recording. Okay, got it. Um, and um, so uh, my co-author is Ananda Martin Coy, who uh, is currently employed at the Census Bureau, but and a PhD candidate here at NYU. In the fall, she'll be a an assistant professor of sociology and demography at Brown. Um, and uh, and we're collaborating on this, and it builds on a paper she published in ASR in uh, December of 2021, and uh, and I hope some of you have had occasion to see it. Um, and this is the a follow-on paper uh, based on that. So for far too long, sociologists uh, asked if higher education paid off. Fortunately, that uh, has has pretty much uh, been resolved in the positive. Uh, that is to say that nearly all the research on the US labor market finds that education leads to higher earnings, but not to the same degree for everyone. There's a, a lot of very interesting work on heterogeneity in the in educational pay gaps. Some of them go so far as to be able to make causal claims and we can talk about re returns to education. In the first draft of this paper, um, Ananda and I did that, but Jenny Brand made us quit it, um, and and to which uh, to whom we are grateful for you know making us be honest about uh, the our uh, what we're really looking at. So I'm going to try and discipline myself and talk only about educational pay gaps, uh, but it's one form of heterogeneity. There's a vast literature on racial, gender, uh, and uh, temporal variations in heterogeneity and uh, educational pay gaps, uh, smaller literature uh, in sociology on socioeconomic and uh, class origin differences. Florencia Torche and I have both uh, made contributions to that literature. And there's a way to read Jenny Brand's work with Yeshia as also reflecting the way in which uh, people from lower socioeconomic origins get a bigger pay, uh, a bigger payoff from higher education. And I have a lot to say about that, but that's not this paper. And so in the interest of time, I'm just going to say that um, this is the kind of work on which we are trying to build. Um, and the direction in which we are building is, is actually a rather intuitive direction um, where, uh, in which um, you know bear, the thought is that some jobs have a bigger gap between the, uh, the, the pay of college graduates and the pay of high school graduates, or the pay of people with advanced degrees and the people with bachelor's degrees, uh, or the pay of people with some college and a high school diploma than other occupations have. And the immediate two inspirations for this paper were a paper by uh, Siwei Cheng uh, and uh, two graduate students here at NYU on the um, computer industry and the way in which some occupations uh, relied on credentials and others did not. Um, and then Ananda's own work on, uh, uh, on what's in an occupation and gender segregation and racial segregation in occupations that was published, as I mentioned, in ASR in 2021. There's also uh, a link to some work in Germany by uh, Annette Friedrich and a co-author who I haven't met. Um, and um, also something I learned uh, very recently is that um, the late Alan Kruger's dissertation actually addressed issues very similar to the ones we we're addressing, although uh, Kruger's work was on industry differences rather than on uh, occupational differences. I'll have to add that to this slide eventually. Um, but uh, we can we can draw up a classic Blau Duncan looking uh, path diagram here, and we've got all, uh, socioeconomic origins, and then a whole bunch of X factors uh, that we're going to try and control here, and then focus in on a triangle defined by education, occupation, and earnings. Blau and Duncan themselves did not look at earnings, but in subsequent work, Otis Dudley Duncan did. Uh, back in the 1960s, and there's a whole long list of uh, socioeconomic, I mean, of sociological and labor economic studies that have explored this triangle. 
Um, but what we're looking at today is the way in which education and occupation interact uh, in the determination of earnings. Um, and, and so that's really going to be our focus. Um, and, uh, and so let me get on with it. Um, the, the empirical question is just descriptive. You know, to what extent do these pay, gra do these pay gaps uh, and in particular, we're going to use a linear specification and then extrapolate uh, the gap between uh, university graduates and secondary graduates, even for occupations, and I'll explain more about this as we go along, even uh, for occupations where we don't observe any university graduates or very many of them, or occupations where we don't observe very many secondary graduates, uh, uh, we'll just basically extrapolate the line down and make a fictional uh, difference for every one of the 451 occupations uh, for which there were more than 10 people in the uh, uh, um, current population survey data that we're looking at and make a, make a calculation then of the gap between a college graduate and a high school graduate in that occupation. Uh, aspirationally, we would like to get to returns to education, but as we don't have uh, the kinds of measures of uh, factors that select people into higher education, we're just going to proceed in a, uh, in a descriptive way. Uh, and then with that task completed by, uh, let's say, 1235, um, we, we will turn to the question of, do these pay gaps vary among occupations? Um, and if so, uh, sorry, we'll establish that they vary among occupations and, and what predicts that variation. Um, there are some hypotheses in the literature, Claude Fisher and, uh, and myself and various colleagues in Inequality by Design actually raised this question back in uh, 1996. Uh, there is the huge literature on skill bias technological change uh, there are also um, institutional studies within sociology pioneered by Don Tryman in the 70s, uh, most famously Esping Anderson in 1990. Less famously, but more, it turns out, useful uh, is Bruce Western's pre-mass incarceration work uh, entitled Between Class and Market, um, his work on how labor unions um, affect pay um, actually turns out to be uh, something we can leverage quite a bit in this analysis. Um, and, and we're going to make a lot of use of it. Uh, for those of you who can't stick around for uh, the whole time, I'm going to give you the findings and then show you the evidence. Uh, so at first, uh, just to note that um, if we ignore occupation and just look at uh, the gap between a a uh, typical college graduate and a typical high school graduate, uh, the pay gap is about 55%. Uh, and, um, and what we're going to do then is, uh, uh, after a whole lot of controls and so on, look at the within uh, occupation gap. And it turns out to be about half of that. Uh, it's 25 percentage point, or 25%. Um, which is bigger than I expected it to be. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and then, uh, but it varies substantially. Uh, the, um, in particular, at the 90th percentile, the, uh, the gap was 53%. And, and I don't know why these are in proportions instead of percents now suddenly. But, uh, and, and at the 10th percentile, 11%. So there's, there's quite a bit of variation across occupations. So we've, and so um, uh, that empirical goal is, uh, is I'm gonna have a lot to say about it because to really appreciate it, you have to look at some of the details. But um, and then we'll turn to explaining it. The socioeconomic status of the occupations actually account for a third of it. Most of the big gaps occur in occupations that have high pay and require a college degree, um, but not all. Uh, and similarly, most of the 
Low return occupations are things like drivers uh, for which there is low pay and low, uh, low credentials. Um, but institutional factors also play into this quite a bit. We will eventually see that uh, unions, for example, for the most part, flatten educational differences among, uh, among workers, except in the educational sector, where we find pretty much the highest pay gaps uh, anywhere. And I'll have more to say about that too. And to our surprise, and we have tried multiple specifications to try and coax something out of these data, but uh, we find absolutely no evidence to support skill bias technological change. And in fact, in our first specification, the coefficient on uh, SBTC uh, was negative. Okay, so that's where we're going. How are we going to get there? Um, our model is a hierarchical nested model. Uh, with a million, 1.1 million individuals and 252 occupations. Um, these are the, uh, there are actually more occupations in the Census Bureau's classification of occupations, but some were too small uh, to include in the regression. Um, there are, uh, we will we'll have an individual level pay model or um, where annual wage and salary income will be a function of the person's education, gender, race, race ethnicity, the year in which we're observing them, uh, which runs from 2003 up to 2019. I think the title I sent Michelle said 2018, but we've got the 2019 data now. Um, age in five-year groups, uh, region of the country, employment status, um, which includes a specification of hours of work, and industry in 10 groups. Um, each of these is centered so that we can interpret the intercepts. It's a tricky detail in using hierarchical linear models that uh, uh, you have to center all the, all the variables, and so we do. Then on top of that, we overlay random intercepts for occupations. Mo many of you will be familiar with models of that sort, but we also specify random slopes for education, gender, and race. So the first three of our individual level predictors will actually, we're allowing for heterogeneity in those. Uh, for education, that's the main thing we're interested in, but I, I didn't want to specify a model that didn't have any competition, that didn't take into account the way in which other competing factors might confound anything we would see in a model that had a random slope for education, but all the rest of the slopes were treated as homogeneous. And so um, there's big literature on gender pay gaps within occupations. Uh, so we put in a random term for that and, uh, and also a random, pay, uh, random term for uh, black-white differences, not others, uh, but black-white differences in pay. Now, um, we could, in fact, <clears throat> do this entire analysis with uh, just dummy variables for the 452 occupations and then interact all of that. The, the point of using the hierarchical linear model is to basically shrink some of the, use a, um, a post first estimation uh, uh, refinement of the model to shrink small occupations back toward the center and to tame to some extent the uh, the variability that we would observe if we um, if we didn't if we didn't use the HLM approach um, in a in a difference from many applications of these though we allow the random variables to be correlated with one another so that even on our uh, high capacity server here, uh, it takes the model about a day uh, to converge uh, um, because we're allowing the random variables all to be correlated with one another. And our follow-up paper, uh, not this one, but a follow-up paper will actually explore in more detail what those uh, correlations are. We haven't thought about it, so I'm not going to talk any more about it, but they exist. They're uh, part of the model. We just haven't understood them yet. Um, the supplementary model will treat occupations as a unit of analysis and 
set up a simple regression where the random slope on education uh, will then become the dependent variable. And we will attempt to predict that value at the occupation level using the socioeconomics index for that occupation, uh, various measures of technical skills drawn from ONET, and uh, an index of occupational complexity that Ananda developed for her 2021 paper. Uh, she actually measured uh, job title similarity, and we just take one minus uh, her similarity measure. Um, per Bruce Western, we focus in on union representation as an important factor. Um, we also isolate, based on descriptive analysis, uh, the education and child sector, child care sector, and drivers, uh, people who drive trucks, taxis, etc. Because um, you'll see in a second, they kind of stand out as virtually zero. Uh, our data come from uh, IPMS uh, by way of the Census Bureau, or from the Census Bureau by way of IPMS, I guess is the right way to say it. Uh, we restrict the sample to 25 to 69 year olds who were educated in the US, have earnings uh, reported in the year before the uh, annual socioeconomic supplement, and uh, were interviewed between 2020, between 2003 and 2019. Um, and our covariates come from a variety of different sources. Here's what the, here's a kernel density plot of the random slopes on education transformed into the pay gap between university graduates and high school graduates in percentage terms. So that on average, a slope of 0.17 translates into a gap between university graduates and high school graduates of about um, 38 percentage points. Um, but you also can see, can you see my uh, yeah. arrow yeah. move along here? There's there's quite a mass below. There's a handful of really small occupations like drivers, not elsewhere classified, that, that hang below zero. We're not going to tend to that. We don't actually believe it's, it gets below zero, but, but the zero is probably real. Um, and then there are lots of occupations, including a cluster here in the educational sector that have really high ones. Um, and so this is our principal you know, this is what we set out to find, and this is what it looks like when we found it. Um, but at this point, occupations are anonymous or de-identified. Um, and we want to put a little substance on that. Oh, whoops, first a, uh, a word um, that's not in the written version of the paper, but is important for understanding how the model works. Here are three panels that show a handful of occupations uh, as, as we work them out. The vertical differences among the occupations have to do with differences in the random intercept. We're, we are focusing in on the differences in slope. And in the right-hand panel, we've got occupations that have particularly high slopes, like CEOs and legislators, sales reps in wholesale, convention planners, uh, which is a small occupation, but uh, useful for illustrating the fact that we don't have much support for estimating much of anything for that occupation. And, and so it's the hierarchical linear model's ability to borrow information from adjacent occupations that allows us to identify this within occupation, even for occupations that are collapsing on to um, a lot of information for one educational category, but little information for the others. Um, and uh, a prime case for consideration of the substance of what we're actually finding here is the elementary school teachers. Uh, there, there actually are quite a few elementary school teachers, it turns out, in these data who have only some college. They don't have a BA. Many who have a BA and some who have advanced degrees. That's what this some college, bachelor, and advanced degree. And this this slope here is, is going to be, uh, it's, it's among the steepest we observe and it's, it's, it's something I'm gonna talk a lot about. For all occupations, what we do is then take the fitted models gap between the 
people, the person sometimes real, sometimes imagined person with a BA and the sometimes real and sometimes imagined person with a high school uh, degree. And we then make that a percent of the baseline uh, uh, of the baseline income and make then the percentage difference between the college graduate and the high school graduate uh, in, their, in their pay. Even for occupations that are clustered above high school, like elementary school teacher, or below high school, like retail salespersons, um, we're going to have a focus. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're standard, using the linearity of the model to uh, give us a number for absolutely all of them. Over here in the low category is one more occupation worth attending to. Physici physicians and surgeons all have advanced degrees except for measurement error. And so because of some random measurement error, we've got a handful of BA surgeons and physicians that because that's a random attribution, they've got a physician's pay, but they don't have a physician's credential. We get a flat line for them. And this caused a bit of a problem. There's like a dozen or 14 such occupations in the, in the whole analysis. And, um, and they caused it a problem in, initially. And so we created a dummy variable uh, that is one, if 90% or more of a given occupation's uh, incumbents are all in the same educational category and zero otherwise. And so it basically fits those folks um, independent of the rest of the data. We didn't throw them out. We, we uh, just gave them all one average amount by which they're distorting the data. I'm not going to report that coefficient in the charts that, that you'll see, but they're in the background of all the models that I'll present. Okay. Are there questions then on the model? People understand what we're doing? It's a hierarchical linear model at the occupation level, random slopes that look like this, either steep or shallow or average. And, uh, and then we're making uh, a hypothetical calculation for every occupation of the gap between the college graduate and the high school graduate. And the, in fact, the linear model has a kink in it here is because the, there's the, the gap here is, uh, is bigger than one because of a sheepskin effect that, uh, that we estimated. Mike, I have a question. Sure, Liara. So I, I wrote into the chat, but I'll try asking it. Yeah, so, it's better to ask. I'm not looking at the chat. I can't even see that there is chat. Right. So the fact that you include young adults, like the 25 to 29 year old, for example, like they're still going to get more, some of them will get more education yeah. and they will get more experience. And I'm wondering, do those things, I don't know, sort of vary such, such that they're going to affect how you interpret the gaps? Yeah. Like so yeah, so as you might imagine, we've got 40 different flavors of this model uh, where we throw out people. In this specification, we've thrown out people who have uh, zero earnings. We also, in some specifications, throw out people who have just a couple thousand dollars of earnings, uh, and we vary that sli slightly. We also have moved the pay gap up, or, sorry, the age cutoff up from 25 to 30, and and even as high as 35. Um, I actually prefer this one because of the selection that goes into not starting a career until you're 30 or 35. I know present company includes a lot of folks who are in that uh, universe, but, um, uh, and, and certainly that's the case for some of the most credentialed occupations in the data set. But it's not the reason why the physician, for example, comes across with a slope of zero. It's it is the other thing, which is that the the um, the variation in education among physicians is noise. Uh, it's it's random coding error, and so uh, various specifications uh, uh, give us roughly the same results. And among the variations that we have considered, I still like to stick with the literature standard cutoff of twenty five. Hearing very clearly what you said, I've even said exactly that to other presenters over the years. 
but it's uh, it, it's the convention, but it also has a selection logic behind it that I'm going to stick to. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mike, can I ask quickly, do many people have more than one job or how does that factor in? Uh, if they do, we don't know. So the ASEC asks about if a person says, uh, mentions more than one job to the interviewer or if they're filling it out online they don't have the option of entering more than one but the interviewer is instructed say no we, we're interested in your main job your principal job well i actually have you know five that i have to patch together to make it well pick one please and tell me about it is literally what happens in the interview uh so we know about one uh the one that the respondent wanted to talk about So on the screen now, you can see the, the top end, the 20 biggest pay differences. Uh, there, there are a couple of very small occupations we didn't include here. There, so we had a, uh, uh, they have to be medium size or bigger occupations in order to be here. And I've put in a kind of orangish color, um, the, uh, the ones in the education field because they are, they're a really important subset here. Uh, so all the teachers, post-secondary, secondary, pre-K, secondary, pre elementary, special ed, uh, and education administrators all end up at the very high end of, of our estimates of the pay. And there's an actual, you know, an, an ethnographer could find this by spending some time at uh, high school uh, or, or um let's say school board meetings, listening to discussions of teachers pay because over and over again across the country, teachers unions have negotiated for them uh, a, uh, a pay bump every time they get another credential. Most states require teachers to go back for recertification three in every three to five years. That often entails en enrolling in master's level classes at a school of education near them. And uh, for that, they receive college credit and eventually they receive a master's degree. And uh, in most school boards or in school, most school districts, at least public ones in the United States, they then get a pay bump, a guaranteed pay bump. And this is a highly institutionalized automatic payoff to uh, an increase in educational credentials within an occupation that actually results in some of the highest that we see here. Many of the others have um, uh, are high status, high credential occupations that have substantial credential differences, and in particular differences between people with college degrees and advanced degrees that also translate here into some of the highest returns. Um, people, for example, in the advertising field, economists who are in non-academic settings, pharmacists, dietitians, uh, optometrists, uh, librarians get pay off to having a higher credential as well. Not the automatic one that the school teacher gets, but, but pretty substantial ones. Um, there's also something above and beyond what I was describing because post-secondary teachers actually aren't most, most of us are not covered by those kinds of unionized contracts, uh, but still uh, we show up as, as a pretty high uh, pay difference between um, uh, the ones with PhD and, and, and the ones with a master's degree. Um, might have to do with the difference between a research university and a community college or something like that. But anyway, uh, there, there's something else behind that for us. But for the most part, it's that union-driven pay bump uh, that, is, that is going on uh, for a significant fraction of the upper tail of educational uh, payoffs. Um, that's probably the most sociological thing I'll say all day. Um, the, uh, and then at the low end, we've got drivers, truck drivers, taxi drivers, vehicle repair workers, cleaners of vehicles, and drivers not elsewhere classified, along with a hodgepodge of other occupations like um, barbers, glaziers, uh, human resources clerks, um, not human resources officers, not uh, but but clerks in HR offices, uh, personal care and service workers, not elsewhere classified. A lot of heterogeneous, heterogeneous occupations, in other words. Um, 
uh, also have uh, relatively low uh, college pay gaps, as are a, no a number of these occupations are also highly unionized. And I'll have more to say about that in a moment. Okay. So um, have you had a chance to read these, absorb this, and get a feel here? I'm going to move on. Um, to the second part of our analysis. This is the analysis. Now the outcome variable is the um, within occupation pay gap. And we start with a baseline model that is predicting this with the three things mentioned in the literature, the, the socioeconomic factor, the complexity factor, and skill bias technological change. And as I noted in the preface, the, S, the SBTC has a um, has the wrong sign. Uh, meanwhile, complexity, all else being equal, a more complex job uh, appears in the first regression to show a substantial increase in um, uh, in the in the college high school pay gap. After we control for a number of other factors it's even bigger than it first appears. Um, that, that complexity of the occupation, uh, doing a more complicated job uh, is, uh, is one source of, of, of higher pay or higher pay gap between college graduates and high school graduates. There's also a second factor hidden under this uh, um, coefficient, which is that some of the most complex occupations are actually amalgams of different occupations that the Census Bureau itself has uh, aggregated into a single category because individually they're small. Um, and, and so they put them all into one category. Uh, and so that complexity also then would perhaps match a, uh, uh, an occupation mostly done by college graduates and with high pay and a different occupation, although it looks on the, to the Census Bureau like the same occupation uh, done by high school graduates um, who are paid less. Mike, can uh, I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, can you remind us what is the socioeconomic status variable? So that's an occupation level characteristic or? Yes, it's an occupation level characteristic that is literally uh, the proportion uh, with some college and proportion uh, in the occupation who have above average pay added together and divided by two. So it's a score from zero to 100 uh, developed by Otis Dudley Duncan back in the 1960s and updated to subsequent um, census reclassifications of occupation. This is the 2010 reclassification and uh, generating these scores was actually my own work uh, back in uh, 2016. I published a paper presenting these new scores. I but it's an occupational level that's uh, basically pay and credentials of the occupation averaged together. I see, I guess I was just um, unsure of one thing, which is the occupation pay gap by education kind of is the same variables so it's sort of the socioeconomic status is kind of the same variables you're regressing on each other as kind of another control. And I don't know, it just feels how sensitive are results to functional form on that. And yeah. Yeah, there, yeah. Uh, the Duncan paper has been cited over a thousand times. So there's a substantial literature on this. Um, and uh, uh, in the interest of time, I don't want to rehearse it, but um, I, I think that most practitioners in the field regarded as a sufficiently separated uh, set of measurements that the individual level estimated pay gap uh, and this um, socioeconomic different uh, socioeconomic score are 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 different are different aspects of um, of the occupation and and can be thought of separately. Um, yeah, will. I have another question about the, the specification in terms of the technical skills variable that you're yeah. trying to look at skill bias tech, uh, technological change. And I, I'm wondering how the change 
fits into the specification. Like, you know, others like Rob Valletta have argued that, you know, mid and, and lower skilled jobs have had declining returns to education over the past few decades. Yeah, um, that's that's an interesting uh, point. I'm gonna have to look up that paper and refresh my memory of it. Um, but but for the most part, yeah, the change is just something that somebody along the line hung on there. It's it's always been um, uh, well the the yes SBTC argument is that we've we've seen rising pay gap between college graduates and high school graduates precisely because um, the technology has changed. Uh, I guess the implication of our findings uh, here once I get through and uh, talk about this uh, labor union representation and its importance here is to note that the decline of the unions is probably a more substantial part of it. Uh, and there's a there's also a labor econ literature on this. Um, uh, a number of folks have, have, have made this argument over the last 15 years that, that we, we, we focus on the new, uh, the, the technology, but uh, actually the demise of the unions has probably had more to do with rising gaps uh, than uh, than the than the technology. And ours is a contribution to that uh, debate on the side of the of the institution uh, institutional point of view as opposed to the technological point of view. Yeah, and it, I I just love to see this for different time periods, even within your your twenty years. It's good to look at this for the first few years and then estimate the model again for the most. Oh yeah, years. yeah, yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, um. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get estimates for uh, early and uh, yeah. Thanks, Will. Uh, to to focus in and to say out loud what I've pointed at, uh, the union factor is is quite substantial. On average, uh, unions across the board, unions are reducing educational pay gaps because what unions typically argue for is the uh, is a preference of seniority over pay, over credentials in the setting of pay within occupations. And so for the most part, highly unionized occupations, uh, well, okay, more unionized, there aren't highly, there are very few highly, uh, highly union, unionized occupations left in the US economy, but the relatively highly unionized ones have much lower pay differentials than, uh, than the ones where uh, unions are absent. Um, and, uh, and that's a standard negotiating strategy. And we can actually tease out a second part there. This is probably our, our estimate here includes that educational sector where in fact unions have negotiated the, um, the opposite, a, a guaranteed payoff to credentials uh, for teachers. And, and so when we pull that sector out and, and let it take its value, our estimate for the rest of the economy is that unions reduce uh, educational pay gaps uh, by about a quarter. Um, and and it's it's a pretty substantial uh, a pretty substantial slowdown of what um, is an economy wide trend um, and and it would be one way in which increased unionization were it to ever occur uh, might in fact reduce the degree of educational uh, pay gaps uh, within within specific occupations. This is once again, not economy-wide, this is within occupations, but outside the educational sector, it's a pretty substantial, and we were quite impressed by uh, the magnitude of this effect. Um, to help, you know, for those who are uh, comfortable with tables, this is this is the definitive set of results. I, I rendered it uh, dropping one of the models rendered it in a, in a graphical form here. These are exactly the same uh, coefficients and their standard errors just lined up you know, with the dot plot uh, to, to help you see this. Um, 
And uh, I also like staring at this, uh, this chart, and this is where I'll end. Um, here we look at the socioeconomic index arrayed along the x-axis and our within occupation pay differences. Uh, this isn't the pay differences, this is the slopes, the uh, within occupation uh, slopes. And um, the size of the circle is proportional to the size of the occupation. And, the, uh, and then I pulled out and labeled some of the biggest positive and negative residuals. You know, we've got our famous uh, physicians and surgeons example there and our elementary teachers there, but some others to look at uh, the stock sales agents stood out before and the pharmacists stood out before, but even in the low end, there were positive residuals like uh, packaging uh, machine operators, for example. Um, uh, I don't know much about that occupation, but it had a big residual. Um, and there are a collection of negative residuals for occupations that have technician in the title. So engineering technicians, um, diagnostic technicians, network and IT administrators, um, and, and then helping occupations like dental hygienists and so on, that, that relative to the socioeconomic standing of the occupation have a surprisingly low um, uh, educational pay gap. And these are, with the exception of the postal service clerks and mail carriers, uh, occupations that are big residuals in our between occupation regression that we were just looking at. So from the if we take the residuals from this one uh, and look at these residuals, they're, they're pretty much the same ones, although unionization does do a nice job of capturing uh, this big negative residual for, uh, for postal service workers. Um, and uh, with that, I can go back to the conclusions, but I actually think this is a probably a better slide uh, to leave on the screen, and then I can take uh, questions. I think it's time to for me to be quiet and take a few more questions. Although I appreciate uh, Will and Leora jumping in already with questions. Yeah. Thanks. Any anyone in the room have a question? We have a question. Oh, chance. Mike, thanks tons. Um, you said you said you've got gender adjusted in all of this. Do you want to say any more about gender stratification here? Um, first of all, uh, all of those gaps are are negative. We didn't find the the missing occupation that pays women more than men uh, uh, adjusted for for everything else. But we don't have yet. A, uh, a very good, uh, well, or any, frankly, uh, model of the between uh, occupation differences in, uh, in the gender gap. Um, Ananda has a paper on differences in exactly what men and women are doing within the occupations that she's workshopping in our inequality workshop this week. And, uh, will present at ASA this summer. Um, and um, hopefully uh, that will shed some light on it and make us, you know, give us some more measures that, at the occupation level that we can use to help predict the, um, uh, the gender gap within the occupation net of the educational pay gap and net of the, uh, of the racial pay gaps. Uh, but, but at this point, we don't, we, we haven't gotten there. That's the next paper. We want to get this paper finished uh, and under review, and then we're going to move to the next one. Um, let me say one more thing about Ananda's project, which is that she is analyzing the actual words people use to describe their occupation. So the ASR paper was based on the digitized text that the uh, GSS interviewers recorded while the person was describing their job. And then somebody read that, somebody from the Census Bureau read that text and uh, assigned a census occupational code, four digit, or in the case of the 2010 code, to the occupation. Um, but Ananda is actually analyzing the 
the, the verbatim text. Uh, the ASR paper was based on the GSS verbatims. Now that she's working at the Census Bureau, she's working uh, directly with the uh, ACS text. The American Community Survey asks exactly the same questions, and people enter themselves uh, uh, or to an interviewer occasionally um, a description of their occupation. And she's analyzing that to capture the tech, the task complexity and the title complexity of within each of the 452 occupational titles. And, and, and also now working on the gender gaps, you know, the way in which women describe their jobs is substantially different than when who, men who end up with the same uh, four digit code. There are also instances of men and women using the same text but because they have a different job title, they end up in a different census code. And some um, pretty much describe the same set of tasks, but um, somehow the men and the women end up classified differently. And so um, she'll have more to say about that as this project, as her project evolves. That's the point of intersection between hers and mine. Um, and I think that, the, yeah, our next paper is going to be one where we develop uh, the same kind of prediction equation for the other two random slopes, both the racial and gender ones. But thanks for that, Jenna. But unfortunately, no, I don't, this is, no, this is honestly, up in the project. I don't, I don't have it. That was um, a great yeah, answer, welcome back next April. With, uh, <laughs> with a, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for this interesting talk. Uh, so I had a question about geography. Uh, I may have just missed this, uh, but I was thinking, you know, within occupations, I assume higher educated people are more likely to move to urban areas that have higher cost of living and higher corresponding salaries. Uh, and I was just wondering how your model uh, is accounting for that or how you're thinking about that. Uh, yeah, next. I guess there's two points of view of that. One is some sometimes people move to different places because the pay is higher, uh, um, and sometimes people get offsetting higher pay because everything else costs more in a given area. I mean, some some of the high paying cities have uh, raised their minimum wage more than others, so there's some evidence on the on the side of the second one, but I think that for the most part, uh, I think most of the, to my reading of the literature, most of the support is on the side of the people go to expensive places because they think they can live there because the pay is already higher. Um, um, I'm not, you know, there are some who say you need a, a geographically based cost of living index or some kind of CPI equivalent for different cities. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, and I'm showing now that I lived in the Bay Area in New York my whole adult life. But, um, you know, there's a reason I didn't stay in Bloomington. Um, and, uh, and 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 uh, pays part of it. Um, and also what I can do with the money uh, once I'm once I am somewhere. Now, you know, people in, introspection isn't always the best guide, but I think the literature backs me up on saying that it's more that the high paying jobs are in the expensive places uh, than than it than it is that um uh than the other way around um so yeah i i haven't done any the short answer is i haven't done anything about it but the longer answer is i don't think you should great thanks do we have any questions on we have a question from ron Ron, do you want to ask your question? Was that Ron you were yes. contacting? <laughs> <laughs> and do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, Mike, I'm thinking that education is a kind of input for production, and that for the most part, it's easy to observe that input. Mm -hmm. But in many occupations, maybe most occupations, it's practically impossible to really view an output. And so, okay, you're gonna have big educational differentials because the assumption is more education makes you more productive. Right. But some of the occupations uh, will have very readily available outputs. And 
And it might be that if you could slice the data that way, that might be another variable of interest. If you can observe the output, then you don't need to rely on education so much for determining your compensation. So sales reps, drivers, mm -hmm. uh, contractors, maybe, I don't know. There'd, there'd be some job oh, like occupations like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, <laughs> um, right, if there are commissions, if there are peace, if there's piecework, if piece the, work, yeah. if the, if the, if the, uh, if the compensation is not a function of the hours on the time on task, which it is for most occupations, but rather is um, is is tied to output. If we could identify those, and I'll bet ONET can identify those for us. Um, how would the model? How how does the model look? Or could we put out based output based compensation into our prediction model and, and learn something. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. And, and presumably there would be selection of people with, there'd be adverse selection of people with educational credentials into those roles. It would only be people who sort of failed in other things where right. their educational credential would be worth more. Right. Yeah. The proverbial history uh, PhD with a, you know, who's driving for Uber. Um, or in the yeah. old days, used to be driving a taxi. Um, we di we didn't find him in the data, by the way. Um, there 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 are no uh, taxi drivers identified here with advanced degrees uh, in the in the ASEC throughout the 21st century. Um, but um, the point is well taken that um, the adverse selection into some of the some of the flatter uh, occupations among those people who have uh, who have substantial credit uh, credentials is a is an important point. I'll also point out though that the 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 random intercept um, has a correlation with the with the with the pay slope of about 0.3. So part of what the SEI regression that's uh, that I you know that I left you with. Um, Part of what that's picking up is, I think, um, that same correlation. So there is something about uh, just the way in which education and compensation are tied together in the US labor market and in any post-industrial labor market that makes, makes that correlation intrinsic that people go to school a long time uh, in part because they they expect it to pay off and in part uh, employers pay for those credentials because it takes a long time to learn how to do our job or to be a pharmacist or to be a physician or surgeon. And um, whereas uh, you can probably, um, you know, teach somebody to do filing or, or some of the less, uh, both less remunerated and less pay graded, pay uh, gradiented occupations uh, probably have a quicker learning curve or a training uh, specification that doesn't involve the kind of training that's involved. Um, also, Sam Bowles used to argue, and I can't, I, I, I have to bring this up too. Partly, employers uh, when they when they search for college graduates, part of what they're they're, they're hoping for and think they're paying for are the non-cognitive skills that are highly associated with success in educational institutions like um, showing up all the time, showing up on time, uh, and, um, and, and focusing on a given task instead of, you know, feather bedding. Um, and, um, and, and therefore, um, I think that's also embedded in here is that, uh, part of the payoff to education is the behavioral traits that that signals as well as the human capital of the content of the degree. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, uh, pulling it out, uh, with some sort of, uh, commission job, uh, piecework job, et cetera, uh, variable might be a useful uh, next step for us. Thanks, Ron. Thank you.
I have time for one more quick question. There's one chat. Or... Okay, great. All right, well then please join me in thanking uh, Mike. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Thanks. Well, thank you all for your attention. Yeah, and for great comments. Thank you.